and welcome to session 22, Choice and Preference. Uh, let me offer you all uh, an early congratulations because we are really in the home stretch of this particular uh, uh, sequence of classes. Uh, in the previous sessions, we had covered uh, the basic behavioral processes uh, and went into great depth into what they are, how we define them, how we make uh, uh, distinctions between operant, respondent, between positive and negative reinforcement, how we come to understand the etiology of these behaviors. And we also talked at great length about the, uh, <clears throat> the place of operant behavior in the grand scheme of things relative to um, where it came from in the evolution of the species and so on. So at this point, what we're going to be doing is getting into areas of what we call complex behavior. And over the years that I've been teaching uh, behavior analysis, I've been fascinated by many different areas of behavior. Uh, but four areas seem to always uh, crop up in terms of really cool areas of research uh, and things which I believe are uh, applicable to things that practitioners will be doing from time to time. And although these things are not necessarily uh, talked about quite often in the circles of practitioners, certainly in the circle of applied behavior analysis and in the grander uh, category of behavior analysis, these are four very popular areas of research. Again, I mentioned choice and preference and what we are going to discuss in terms of the quantification of behavior. And then we will talk about verbal behavior and go through many examples of uh, descriptions of verbal behavior. We will cover uh, the application of uh, understanding verbal behavior in complex events uh, in a series of experiments conducted by Epstein and Skinner, the Columbus Simulation Project. And then we will finish up by going into stimulus equivalents, uh, private events, and then cultural analyses, and then finally wrap up with radical behaviorism. So in talking about this section, let me, let me start off by <clears throat> pointing out something to you. In your chapter, uh, which is uh, chapter um, nine, choice and preference in uh, Pearson Cheney. Uh, I want you to definitely read up to page 212, okay? Um, and as you go through that, uh, if you have questions, certainly you can write them down. We're going to cover a lot of this stuff to make it a little bit easier for you. Uh, I don't require you to actually read the uh, the advanced section, but you know, if you choose to do so, please feel free to do that. That would be fine. Um, it's very interesting stuff. Uh, at least I think it's kind of interesting. You might not, but don't be afraid of the math. Actually, I would encourage you to uh, to jump headfirst into this stuff because there's some really cool uh, research going on in this particular area. Okay, so to talk about this, one of the things I like to do is I, I, I like to use a lot of props. And uh, what I want to do is kind of go through in terms of talking about choice and preference and understanding how reinforcers uh, strengthen certain behaviors, and in, in particular, what makes reinforcers reinforcing? How do we know that they're reinforcing? And this is something we may want to ask ourselves every single year whenever we buy people birthday presents. Uh, Christmas just passed. What about Christmas presents? When we buy presents for people, why do we choose those presents? Under what conditions do we go into a store and buy this object versus that object? We are making choices uh, in these situations, but we're also trying to figure out what is reinforcing to a person and what is not? In other words, we might ask ourselves, if this person were at the store right now, what would they choose? What behaviors would be maintained at this point in time? So what I want to do is kind of go through a little bit of uh, maybe the ghost of Hanukkah past and show you a little bit of the things uh, that shaped and changed the gifts that I got from my parents uh, and from my kids and um, from the rest of my family. Let's start off with one of the early ones that I got here from my daughter. Uh, now, <clears throat> my daughter and I and the kids, and, uh, we used to play a lot of games. So this is something that she got me a, uh, several years ago. You're all familiar with the game of Candyland, right? Where you move your spaces, uh, your, your piece around the board. Uh, sometimes you could spin and you could land on a color and it says uh, advance three spaces or fall back four spaces. Well, this game is called... Kosher Land, yes, that's right, Kosher Land. The game we've all been dying to play, and it even has on the cover here um, a picture of things related to Kosher Land. You see here, uh, for example, uh, we got a piece of matzah, uh, a white jar, which I wasn't really sure what the heck this was for, for years when I was looking at it. I, I know it wasn't definitely was not a jar of, of uh, Miracle Whip, but it turns out this is a jar of gefilte fish. <laughs> 
yeah, who would have known, right? And, uh, and of course, you move your pieces around the board. It says here, a beginner's game for Jewish children. And it should probably say, uh, a beginner's game for Jewish children who, uh, whose parents did not buy them Xbox. And what you see here, interestingly enough, on the board is a board that's set up just like Candyland, except it pertains to thing, all things that are kosher. Uh, and again, by the way, I am not kosher. Never have been and never will be. It has your little spinner here. You can advance through the board all the way up. Things that help you advance and get to the very end are things such as saying amen after your kiddush, uh, eating matzah. Things that bump you back or eating or, or mixing meat and milk, which is, you know, the biggest uh, thing that you don't do for kosher, uh, and so forth and so on. I'm sure there's an adult version of this in which perhaps uh, in order to advance to the end, you have to do things like call your mother every other day. Uh, and things which bump you back is, is that you, you engage in behaviors that riddle your mother with guilt. Uh, anyway, here you go. Kosher lands. Now, how much behavior did this maintain? It was cute and fun at the very beginning when we looked at it and said, ha, ah, this is a lot of fun. We might have played the game once, and, and, and it has not come out of the box until I just opened this up. This is what I would call a, a, a non-effective reinforcer. It was appreciated at the time, but it seemed pretty much that my daughter was probably in the store and was rushed to buy me something and said, oh, here's something Dad will like. Now I could go out and play with my friends. So... Not a big present uh, in terms of reinforcing uh, efficacy, but she made up it, uh, for that the following year. <sighs> and what she bought me was a game called Floridaopoly. And in this game, it is basically, uh, it's Monopoly, and you see a lot of these around. Now there's every every theme with the same game in Monopoly where they just take the game and, and totally rip off the concept and put in something that is of, of esoteric interest to a few people, <laughs> or maybe many people, uh, in hopes that they will buy a game and say, oh, this has got to be totally different than the original Monopoly game, which I have in my closet. This is worth getting because it's about Gainesville, Florida, and the University of Florida Gators. And as it turns out, this was pretty cool because it was fun playing this, and it was fun to kind of go through and tell my kids all the things that I did at every one of those places across the board. Uh, you know, things like going to the Purple Purpose and, 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 and you know, partying there, going to the Gator games, and so forth and so on. Um, but what was interesting about this was is that I think my daughter got the idea here that anything and everything related to the University of Florida in Gainesville, and in particular the Gators, serves as a conditioned reinforcer. It becomes a nice generic kind of uh, reinforcing stimulus for dad that she knows will work every single time. And how do I know this? You know, how do we know reinforcement works? Because the minute I said, Lindsay, this is a great game. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I, I could not stop the onslaught of Gator-related material for the next couple of years. For example, coasters for my new bar. A little stick-on label here that says Gators. Okay. Gator shirts. Gator blankets. These are those things that you see on uh, on television where you 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 put your arms in it and it becomes it's it's like a uh, a bathrobe and blanket and so forth and so on. Uh, well, now they have all the college logos on here. My daughter bought two of these, and sure enough, very reinforcing. Um, here we go. Keychains. You, you push it, and supposedly it. Oh, there you go. Little cheer of the Florida Gators. Okay? All right, that's obnoxious. Get that out of here. Okay. So, we see a lot of gator stuff here. That's kind of an interesting thing. Now, it turns out that they thought that perhaps things that I find interesting that are related to gators might work for other sorts of things. For example, they knew that I was always into the beetles. So, now they start buying me beetle things. For example, a beetle tie. You know, every beetle fan should actually have these things. Uh, by the way, the thing here that's interesting is, is that although I like the records and I like the music and I have posters, that doesn't necessarily translate over to the fact that I would like to put this thing around my neck and go to professional meetings, which I've never done and never will do. Um, 
not because there's things that are on this, it's because it's a little bit unusual. Uh, now, my daughter did years ago, they got me something which made a little bit more sense, which I did wear. This is a, like a little tie here. By the way, ties are, are popular for presents. And it has pictures of dog, and I'll put that up close so you can kind of see here. Dog and kids and so forth. Now, when my kids were young and I first got this, I wore this quite a lot back in the late 80s. But, you know, when my kids reach a certain age, I stopped wearing this because this did not represent my kids. My kids were teenagers. These were not my kids. So in this situation, we have a reinforcer that was effective, but only for a short period of time. And a reinforcer, which was non-reinforcer, because I never really wore it. Okay. Uh, now, my kids got actually much better at doing this sort of a thing because they knew amongst the things that they could do to determine what dad likes and doesn't like is just watch what dad does, see what dad spends most of his time talking about doing or devoting behavior to, and the chances are those are reinforcing. So amongst the things that I've been doing over a period of time is replacing some of my uh, limited but intense interests in movies and TV shows and so forth with high definition. So this year, I was lucky to get... Ah, uh, Lord of the Rings in high def. My favorite TV show, The Prisoner in high def. Movies in high def, replacing it. Charade with uh, Cary Grant and uh, Audrey Hepburn. Very, very reinforcing. Amongst the other things that my kids know that I find reinforcing is anything that's retro, anything related to the 50s, and in particular, 60s when I grew up. So one of the things I did when we were walking around the store this, this around Christmas time, and my, we were shopping, is I stopped in front of the cereal section, and I saw a box of cereal there, uh, Captain Crunch, which you've all probably you know seen, if not eaten. And uh, it was very interesting because I looked at it, and I have, a co I have it here, Captain Crunch. Now, I am not a big eater of Captain Crunch, but the thing that caught my eye was the fact that, check out the box. This is a retro box from the 60s. In fact, 1963 to be exact, when this serial first came out. And it has some of the retro original things on the back here, which was kind of cool. Now, I looked at this thing here, and I said, wow, wow, that is really neat. Because for years, I've noticed an unusual drift in serial boxes. In fact, you can see here, Check out Captain Crunch. This is the Captain Crunch I grew up with and the Captain Crunch I remember. This is a Captain Crunch who, who sort of looks like this, you know, aging old senile kind of a guy who, you know, is uh, kind of goofy but uh, says, hey, eat my cereal. And compare that with the newer version of the Captain Crunch where you see here what I, what I like to call the, uh, you can see a picture of it. There. There you go. That's a whole different kind of a look. That's the look of not, not a senile, you know, uh, delightful Captain Crunch, so much as maybe a uh, you know, psychotic, uh, give me more cocaine kind of Captain Crunch. Right? That's the kind of stuff on a cereal box that would scare the crap out of me if I was a kid. But <laughs> this looks a little bit friendlier and docile. And it was interesting because this was... A, this was what my daughter gave me as one of my presents. Now, I don't intend to tear into this box and open it and eat it, but the idea here is, is, is that over the years, it took a while for my kids to learn what the reinforcers are for dad. And the thing that I find interesting here is, is that these are presents that, from people who have known me all my life. It took them a while to actually determine what the reinforcers are for dad because they change over time. Therefore, when my daughter was reaching back and my daughter's son was reaching back to things of the past, when they were exposed to me engaging those behaviors, they may say, Dad used to do this, therefore Dad finds these things reinforcing. And over time, they find out that, no, it's not reinforcing, and they have to learn what my reinforcers are. Compare that with something that my in-laws got me for, for, uh, Chris, uh, for Hanukkah time, which is this. It's retro. You can't get this sir, uh, this syrup really any place. I grew up on this stuff, not not uh, quick or anything else. This stuff. And the interesting thing here is, is that my in-laws bought this for the very first Hanukkah present I ever got. In other words, they hit the nail on the head instantaneously. Why? Because they knew me and what my interests are. More recently, they didn't have the competing history of reinforcement. Now, why do I bring all this up? Is because it doesn't take much to determine 
choices and preferences and reinforcers for people. And you got to be careful because those people who know you well do not necessarily know what your reinforcers are. There are a lot of times in which I write behavior plans and the first thing I do to look and find reinforcers is to ask the individual, but more importantly, ask people close to the individual who have known this individual for many years. And they'll say, oh yeah, they like this and they like that and they like that. Uh, and then, oh, they won't like this and so forth. And it turns out I get this list from some of the individuals and it is at best 20% accurate. Uh, then again, I start meeting with people uh, to get information from them, what they think the preferences are. And they don't have this prior frame of reference. They know the individual based on what they've seen most recently. And it turns out when we do reinforcer preferences, you would think that the people who know the individual longest would come up with the individual preferences the first time around. And it turns out that's not necessarily true. Turns out you could get just as much information from people who have just started working with an individual who don't know them well but have done great observations to see what does this person like to do. So with that, I want to go through and start in with this choice and preference stuff. And uh, again, we're going to be getting into some quantification of behavior here, which means necessarily we have to talk about mathematics and so forth and so on. But do not be afraid of these equations. What we're about to cover is really, really cool stuff, and I encourage you, once this course is over and the sequences are over, and I'm sure you will get your board certification, never uh, neglect looking back at the area of what we call the quantification of behavior analysis. Okay, And I would encourage you, when you go to conferences, to start attending these talks. If not the regular talks, go to some of the tutorials on how we come to learn to quantify behaviors and how we come to learn about choice and preference. It's really, really interesting stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and freeze the camera here a second. Okay, and let's go ahead and get started. When we talk about choice and preference, we could look at some of the traditional interpretations of things that we call free choice. Now, this is treated quite extensively in Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and in particular, I would recommend that you familiarize yourself with the chapters on freedom, and in particular, where Skinner does talk about free choice. And he kind of does put things in perspective that we don't really have what's called free choice. What we end up doing is we select and choose amongst things in our environments. And that is how we are going to approach choice and preference in the analysis of behavior. That is, when we talk about people choosing between this or that, more of this, less of that, and so forth, we are uh, looking at the way people distribute operant behavior. How much behavior is devoted to getting this item versus that item? So when we actually start doing an analysis of choice and preference, the things that we look at here are, first of all, the things that people want. That's the first obvious thing. Right? What are the things that people want? And this is the kind of question you ask yourself when you go into a store Christmas time or when you're trying to buy an anniversary present or perhaps a birthday present. And we look around and we say, I wonder what this individual would want. Okay? But what we really want to look at here, more importantly, are what are the conditions that we have to go through to get it? That would actually determine what we would call the response strength. How much behavior is devoted to getting the object? Because we know that if a person engages in a lot of behavior directed towards getting these objects, we could assume that they would be reinforcers, or they would serve as reinforcers under certain conditions. So the question for behavior analysis is, number one, how does one allocate one's time or effort to get an object? And in particular, how do they allocate their time and effort when other things are available? These are the things that we might actually start thinking about looking at in order to determine what the reinforcers are. Just as I just showed you what my kids started doing. They were much better at knowing what my choices and preferences are relative to reinforcers by looking and simply just watching my behavior. When I go to a store to look to buy something, what do I spend most of my time looking and buying and so on? Okay. All right. Now, the way we study this in the operant laboratory is to use something called concurrent schedules of reinforcement. And again, the uh, Pearson Cheney book goes into great detail on this. But let's just quickly go through this and summarize that it involves two or more situations 
each a situation is associated with a specific response, two different responses, but these responses are in effect and the reinforcers are available roughly at the same time. Right? These two situations are independent of one another. That is, if you respond in situation A, it does not affect the availability of reinforcement in situation B. And likewise, if you respond in situation B, it does not affect the situation that you left in situation A. And a lot of times what we will do to study this is just to simply study a, chain, a, a situation in which there are two operant keys in the chamber, key one and key two. Okay? And we will arrange a schedule of reinforcement on both keys and then vary it to see what happens. For example, imagine that we are looking at here in an operant chamber of two response keys. On the left is a key that is lit up green. The schedule of reinforcement is that the average payoff is approximately every 60 seconds. Okay, Average payoff every 60 seconds. So every 60 seconds, you're going to get a payoff of $10. Over in situation on the right side is a red key, and it has the same contingency of reinforcement, $10 and an average payoff every 60 seconds. Okay, What would we do in a situation like that? You could respond here and get paid, but if you spend all your time over here, reinforcement is being set up over here. You could be coming over here and getting reinforced, right? So what we end up doing here to optimize the strategy, because again, this average payoff is on the average every 60 seconds. We're looking at a VI one minute over here and a VI one minute over here. So if you're over here spending all your time here, you're missing reinforcement here. If you spend all your time over here, you might miss reinforcement over here. The optimal strategy is what? That's right, you guessed it, switch. Just go back and forth. Left, right, left, right, left, right. And by the way, this is exactly what pigeons do, rats do, monkeys do, humans do. We all just simply switch back and forth, back and forth. We could find reinforcement here, but we may find it over here. If you're looking for a particular score of a football game, and you don't have any access to it, you know that the scores come up pretty regularly on two different stations, you could simply switch back and forth between two stations until you find a football score that you're looking for. Okay. All right. What about if we change the situation now? Now we have on the left, we alter the schedule of reinforcement from VI one minute to VI 30 seconds. Now on the average, this pays off every 30 seconds, $10. But back here on the right key, which has not changed, it's still a VI one minute schedule, which pays off $10. Now what's the optimal strategy? Here, it would appear that if coming over here, we get reinforcement twice as often. And what you would expect exactly is what? That's right. We spend more time on the left key versus the right key. Why? Because this pays off double the amount of reinforcement in terms of reinforcers per minute, or in this case, per second. Now, do we exclusively respond over here and stop over here? No. Actually, we don't, because to do so, while we're responding here and getting food uh, or getting paid every 30 seconds on the average, we could still occasionally come over here because the 60 second timer eventually does time down. You make one response over here, get the reinforcer, and then switch back over here. So what you see here is a switch in preference, not exclusively for left over right, but certainly in terms of how much time is spent engaging in behavior on left versus right. That's the key. Okay? All right. Let's go ahead and make everything equal again. That is VI 60 second here, VI 60 second here, $10 here, $10 here. And what we get is recovery of the switching behavior, switching back and forth between left and right in order to optimize reinforcement delivery. And now we're going to make another change. We're going to keep the schedule of reinforcement the same on VI 60. This pays off, every, uh, pays off $10, but the right key pays off $20 twice as much reinforcement. Again, what is the optimal strategy? 
And the optimal strategy is to spend more time over here because you have a greater magnitude of reinforcement. Twice as much reinforcement here versus here. Again, we do not get exclusive preference because while you're getting $20 here, it pays to come back over here and nail this particular key because you could always pick up $10 over here. All right. All right, let's go back and make everything equal again and bring back the emergence of switching behavior. Again, when all things are considered and all things are equal, the optimal strategy is to show no differential preference between left and right. In other words, we show essentially indifference. Okay? Until we make, again, another change. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to add on a contingency, a two-second delay. That is, you get paid here every $10 on the average every minute. Over here, $10 every minute. But over here, once the reinforce is delivered, there is a two-second delay before there, you actually get to $10. And over here, there's a two-second delay from the time at which you meet the schedule criteria until the reinforcer drops down to be delivered to you. You've earned it, but it's slightly delayed two seconds here or two seconds here. What do we do in a situation like this? Well, again, this is going to lead to switching. And why does it lead to switching? Not because we've added two-second delays, it's because all things considered, the contingencies of reinforcement on the left key are equal to the contingencies of reinforcement on the right key. Right? Even with adding a two-second delay, if you do it over here and you do it over here, you've still made the two conditions equal, and you would expect switching, which is exactly what happens. But now let's make a slight modification. We're going to keep the same schedule of reinforcement, VI 60 seconds, VI 60 seconds, $10, $10. Two-second delay over here, but over here, the delay is twice as long. Now what is the optimal strategy here? What do we do? We find that this is the optimal strategy in which you get the same reinforcement according to the same schedule. However, you pick it up here twice as fast in the sense that there is a two-second delay here and a four-second delay here. Okay? And there, once again, you don't have exclusive preference for right over left, but you do see, a, you do see the end of switching back and forth, and you see more exclusive time spent over here because you get the reinforcer, all things considered, you get it here a little bit quicker than you do over here. Okay? All right. Now, these are realistic sorts of things that probably doesn't require a whole lot of, you know, thought in, on our part. It would make sense. All things considered, if we could get objects over here, over here, and it costs us the same, we oftentimes will try to pick up the reinforcer that delivers it the quickest. Over here, you get next day service. Over here, you have two-day ground. All things considered, everything costs the same. What are you going to choose? And we usually choose getting the reinforcers quicker, as long as there's no cost in doing so. Okay? All right. So, now we can actually talk about the matching law, in which the relative frequency of a response matches the relative frequency of reinforcers produced by that response. And what you will study when you read Pearson-Cheney is that the performances in these different situations are not judged by how much behavior is produced in the situation, but more so the relative likelihoods that you will put yourself in these various situations. Okay? All right. And what this leads to is something that we call maximizing. That is, when we have multiple opportunities available to us, we will allocate our behavior in such a way as to maximize the probability of reinforcement that we receive from that. That is, we will engage in behaviors that bring us the reinforcers quickest, with the least amount of effort, with the least amount of delay, and provides the most reinforcement for the least amount of behavior. This is what we call maximizing. Okay. Very close to the concept of what they called optimal foraging in the animal literature. And again, this is covered in the Pearson-Cheney book. And this is a look of what the matching law looks like. This is the equation. Now, I know what you're thinking. When you see a mathematical equation such as this, you think, oh my gosh, it is a very scary sort of a thing. But we really should not be scared of math, but many people are. But I could tell you there are many scarier things in the world than the matching law. 
That's pretty damn scary to me. And every year it gets scarier and scarier. It becomes more difficult to understand all of the ex uh, exemptions and all of the things that I need to fill out here. I need to do more and more work, show more and more things. The forms get longer. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, refunds get smaller. And these, <clears throat> this is a fairly daunting sort of a thing for many people, which is sort of the reason why we never hesitate to uh, put off doing these things until usually the last minute. Now, for some people, we find these things reinforcing, but this, to me, is a fairly daunting and scary sort of a thing, at least the Florida that I know. The Florida that I know used to look like this. It was a very happy, joyous place where all of these things were available for people to enjoy and so forth, and they were relatively safe. Nowadays, we have to worry about these things in Florida. What you're looking at here is a picture of uh, Hurricane Andrew. Uh, and we have to figure out when is the optimal time to visit the Sunshine State when you're not going to get, you know, uh, swamped by uh, water and uh, surge, surge, storm surge and things like that. Trying to predict these storms are even more daunting. So when we come back and look at the matching law, and I'm going to walk you through this, I don't want you to freak out by this. This is actually a very cool equation, okay? And when you finish with this class, I hope that when you look at the matching law, it will be sort of looking at somebody who looks like this, a friendly face, okay? It certainly is for many pigeons. And here's our first scenario that a pigeon might encounter. Let's complicate the picture of a choice situation. Previously, I showed you some very simple examples. VI 60 seconds on one key, 60 on another, $10 here, $10 there. Those are fairly simple things to figure out. We put ourselves in those situations. We know what might actually happen. And sure enough, they do. But what happens in a situation like this? A more complicated picture for a pigeon experiment. It starts off with two white keys when you put the pigeon in the chamber or in front of the pigeon. A white key on the left and a white key on the right. If the pigeon pecks this white key, 15 times on the left, FR15, there's a 10 second delay in which the chamber goes dark. After 10 seconds, the left key, which was white over here, now lights up green. If the pigeon responds on this green key, FR1, there's a four second delay, and then there's four seconds of food delivered to the pigeon. When the pigeon gets four seconds of food, everything resets, and pigeon comes back to this original condition. If the pigeon, instead of pecking the left key, pecks the right key, here's what happens. The pigeon has to peck this 15 times. The key or the, root, the chamber goes dark because there's a 10 second delay. And now, instead of just seeing what the pigeon saw up here with just one key, uh, green key, now there are two keys. The first key is green, just like up here. And the contingency of reinforcement is identical. Four seconds delay, four seconds food. It's the same thing that was up here. On the other hand, if the pigeon pecks the right key, which is red, one time, food is delivered, but there's a two-second delay. Okay? What happens here now? In other words, there's two seconds of food and no delay. All right. So let me walk you through this to show you what's going to happen here. Here's the chamber, and two white keys are lit. The pigeon pecks the key. Either one will make the chamber go dark. And here's option one and option two. Option two is that one that was at the very top there. Option two is just peck the green key, four seconds of food, but there's a four-second delay. Okay, So you get more food, but there's a delay. In option one, which was the bottom condition, here's that same condition, four seconds of food, but before you get that food, right after you get the, the you peck this, uh, there's a four second delay. Over here, there's two seconds of food, less food, but there's less of a delay. It's only like 0.1 second delay. And by the way, why is there a 0.1 second delay? Very simple. When the pigeon is pecking either the left key or the right key, when food's delivered, the food is usually delivered where? in a hopper somewhere down here on the wall, right? You see the arrow moving here? That's where the food hopper is. And it takes a pigeon about 0.1 second to move its head from here 
or here, down to here. So inherently, in every experiment we work at with pigeons, no matter what it is, because of the distance of pecking here and eating here, we always, in every scenario, have 0.1 seconds. Okay. However, we can make that delay longer so that even though food is delivered down here, we delay it for four seconds until the pigeon you know, is here, and then four seconds later, food's delivered. Okay? Those are our scenarios. Option one, option two. And note something very important here, that an option one contains option two. In other words, in this situation, the pigeon only has one way of getting food. Over here, the pigeon has a choice. It could choose this, which is the same option as here, or it could have a new and improved type of an option, which gives less food, but gives it quicker. Now you ask the question, what does the pigeon do? Certainly a much more complex scenario than the ones we had just discussed before. So let's just look at one aspect of this. Right? Rather than making it very complicated and try to figure out what's going on in this whole arrangement, let's just take one thing at a time. And let's just look and see, can we predict Again, I'm going to ask you, does the pigeon pick this key or that key? This white key gets the pigeon into that situation. This white key gets the pigeon into this situation, which has that plus that. So can we predict what the pigeon is going to do over here? Well, it might help before we try to predict that is to simply predict what will the pigeon do in this simple situation, right? If we could solve this problem, it might tell us what the pigeon's going to do over here. If everybody follows me. So we're going to start, start by solving this problem here and predict what the pigeon is doing. I'm going to go ahead and advance it here. Okay. Here, again, is that condition. Four seconds of food with a four-second delay, two seconds of food with a 0.1-second delay. And here's where matching law comes into play. We take a look at the responding on the left key relative to the left and right, right? How much responding occurs, again, on this key relative to both keys, left and right, okay? And that equals exactly the time on the left key divided by the delay on the left key. And then you put that fraction over the time on the left key divided by the delay on the left key relative to the time on the right key relative to the delay on the right key. Now, what does this actually look like when we start plugging in numbers? Because that's all you really are doing here. And here's how you do it. Okay, Let's go back and examine the right key, for example. Okay, Here's the right key, the red key. Two seconds of food, but a one-point second delay. So we just simply put that into the equation. Two over point one, which leads to 20. And then we have the relative feature here, red versus green. Again, the time of food over the delay on red plus the time in green, which is four seconds of food, over four second delay. When we do that, we see here that the fraction comes out 0.95, which tells us that given that scenario that I showed you here, the pigeon will spend approximately 95% of its time responding on red, which means that they spend 5% of their time responding on green. And we could actually calculate out these outcomes, put the pigeon into the situation, and lo and behold, guess what they do? It comes really close to this. Okay? So, when we look at just this isolated situation, and we plug in the matching law, it tells us quite effectively that given this scenario and given these variables here, 4 over 4 versus 2 seconds with a 0.1 second delay, that the pigeon will spend 95% of its time pecking red, not green. All right? Now, let's go back to our original question. Given that they start off in this scenario, and they could either peck the white key to get up here, and all they have access to is this green key, or they could peck this key and gain access to both the green and the red key. Now I ask you, 
what do you think the pigeon's going to do? Now, here's the interesting thing. You may say to yourself, well, I think I know. The pigeon, in this scenario here, given this, pecks the red key 95% of the time, which would lead one to believe that red is the reinforcing condition because it's a small reinforcer that's given quickly. And we might conclude that if red is a reinforcer, then the only way the pigeon can get from here to here is to peck this key, right? The right key, white key, will only be the condition which gives access to being able to make this simple choice, red versus green, right? And again, we conclude that because here they spent 95% of the time, here they spent 5% of the time. Why would they respond here to get to green when they would only respond to green 5% of the time? So logic would dictate that this would be where the pigeon will spend most of its time pecking so it could gain access to red. You all with me? Good. Now what we're going to do is calculate, using the matching law, the predicted outcome. Now to do that, I want to point out something interesting to you. This is not an isolated situation, this versus that, because we factor in one thing here that we have to consider. That all things being equal, that might be true that they would choose this situation over here. But now, to get to here or here, there's a 10 second delay and a 10 second delay. Now we factor in another part or another complication into this scenario. In order to do the matching law, we have to now calculate in that 10 second delay, right? It's the time spent responding for the four seconds of food with a four second delay, but now it's really 14 seconds of a delay. And when they do the calculation, it turns out that given the situation up here, right, they in fact will spend 60% of the time responding here to get up here. That is, when you take into account this new delay here, the matching law comes out with a completely different prediction. That is, approximately now, the pigeon will not go to that optimal condition where there's red there. They will actually switch over and go only where there is green. Okay? And in fact, that's what they do. That is, this 10 second delay changes the relative nature and density and frequencies of reinforcement in such a way that they don't do this to get here. They hit this key to get here. Now we ask an interesting question. If we were to vary these 10 seconds delays at what point would this have to be gone? In other words, as this 10 second delay gets shorter and shorter and shorter until it approximates zero, and certainly at zero if there's no delay, then you've got the pure situation. The pigeon responds on the white key to either get up here or get here. So we ask the question, what does this delay have to be for them to switch from here to here? Again, the matching law allows us to predict this. And we do this by just simply taking a look at the second delay here and setting that at t, right? And when we do that and manipulate the value of t from 10 seconds, make it longer, make it shorter, and so forth, we could come away and fit a line which shows us that at four second delay, right, to, you know, you peck the white key and it's a four second delay that gets you to the left or to the right, at that point, we should see indifference. Okay, so let me go back for one second, bear with me. In other words, what this is saying is that if this 10 seconds here and here was actually 4 seconds, match the law would predict that at 4 seconds here and here, you would get simple switching between these two white keys. As the delay gets longer than 4 seconds, you see preference switch from this to exclusively, or almost a higher uh, amount, 60 to 70 percent, over on the left key. If the delay is less than 4 seconds, you will see preference switch to the right key. And that's exactly what this equation shows you. Okay? Short delays will lead to uh, preference for that red key or to the situation which gains access to the red and green key. But at longer delays, they switch over and stick with the one that only gives them the green key. Matching law. Now again, 
based on logic, you would have predicted perhaps something else. But matching law tells us that something else has to be taken into consideration. And the really cool thing about matching law is that we've been using this again and again to predict seemingly very complex behavioral economic situations quite precisely, so much so that not only is this used in behavioral economics, it's also used a lot in comparative psychology and ethology when we're trying to figure out and calculate preferences for, say, an animal eating at one patch versus traveling a distance to eat in another patch. So in the field of behavior analysis, and in particular, the field of what we call the quantification of behavior analysis, we ask some very interesting sorts of questions. Okay. For example, is freedom reinforcing? That would be an interesting question. That is, if we look over in our scenario again, I'm going to come back here, you would think that if freedom is reinforcing, the idea of freedom to choose is in fact an inherent reinforcer. Therefore, getting into this situation arranges for the pigeon to have choice. And simply the idea of being free to choose between two things might be reinforcing. However, we find out that's not true. Under some circumstances, the freedom to be able to choose between green and red might be optimal and might be preferred so it sustains responding that gets you into that situation. But it seems that over here, when the delay is longer, pigeons give up the, the freedom to choose and instead opt to have the experimenter choose for them. In this case, the experimenter chooses green, and now the pigeon is delivering the, uh, the reinforcer or, or allowing the experimenter to choose in this situation. So when we come back and look at these questions about is freedom reinforcing, sometimes it is. Sometimes for many of us, we would ha like to have the option to choose between this versus that. At other times, that's not always very reinforcing. We find a lot of times that sometimes having many choices becomes less reinforcing. For example, I find menus that are fairly simple, more reinforcing, but when I go into a restaurant that has a menu that's like an encyclopedia, sort of like the cheese, Cheesecake Factory, you would think that more things on a, on a menu would be more reinforcing, that I have more choices. And it turns out that's not as reinforcing. I've also written behavior plans in which we've looked at situations in which uh, consumers we've worked with like to have choices, but too many choices actually become something which become overwhelming to them. They would like to minimize choices down to about two or three various options. And a lot of times they'll put themselves into a situation which minimizes the opportunity to have to choose. Okay. All right. The other thing here is, is that quite often we like to choose, but sometimes we give choosing over to people who choose better than us. That is, we like to be able to choose our 401k that we want to do, but a lot of times we might hire or we might actually buy a fund. And that fund, although we choose the fund, we don't necessarily choose all of the various stocks and, fund, and, and options that are available in those funds. We sort of know the, uh, uh, the general category that we're looking at this fund that has utilities. Okay, utilities may be doing well, so we decide to get a fund on utilities. But a lot of times, we don't get into the nitty-gritty of determining every one of those utilities that, that end up in those funds. We may research it, but from time to time, the people who run these funds, it might be a Vanguard account, it might be TD Ameritrade, these stockbrokers are experts on, do, on determining what are the ones that are good, what are the ones that are not. We will also have some which have higher risks or lower risks. We know that we could generally choose between these things, but we don't necessarily get into the nitty-gritty day-to-day activity of deciding when to dump this particular utility versus that one. And instead, we just simply keep the fund and we allow other people to choose. We may actually have stockbrokers who work for us, financial planners who work for us, because we know the decisions that we make may be reinforcing, but they could also very quickly be very punishing. Making the wrong investment, particularly three or four years ago, met with pretty punishing consequences. So at times that we can have freedom to choose our reinforcers, even so, we choose to give it over to somebody else to make those choices for us. It doesn't mean that it's less reinforcing. It just means that sometimes we, we uh, uh, appreciate the freedom. Sometimes we would rather have somebody choose for us. And again, this gets into the next question. Do people prefer to have alternatives available? 
Sometimes we do like having these alternatives. Sometimes we really don't like having these alternatives. Okay. Sometimes if you're working and looking to get a mortgage, for example, and you want to get a fixed mortgage, from the time at which you sign on the dotted line, you could either lock in your fixed mortgage or you could sort of, as they say, let it ride. You let it ride about you know, 10 or 15 days, and then at the time of closing, it'll automatically lock in at whatever the rate is. So you could either choose to lock it in immediately at a certain rate or let it play around and see what happens. Now, here's where you start looking at various options. What's happening? You start listening to the news. You start hearing and listening, saying, are interest rates going to go up or are they going to go down? What is the Fed doing? What is Ben Bernanke doing? Did Ben Bernanke have a good breakfast this morning? Because if he had a good breakfast, he might make a good decision. I tell you, if you watch CSNBC and some of these things like Squawk Box, you would not believe the variables that these guys come up with to try to justify where they think stocks are going to go. And, and quite frankly, you know, when I watch, what's his name, uh, Kramer on TV, not the Kramer from Seinfeld, but uh, the Kramer who does the financial stuff, you know, here's a guy who really needs some serious medication. He is really way out there, which makes him very, very entertaining. Sometimes he hits the nail on the head. Other times he does not, okay? All right, so sometimes these things determine choice. Here's a very important question. Is there an evolutionary basis for preference of free choice? And here what we might be looking at, quite obviously, is, is that we compare how different species respond across various types of choice and preference situations. And we find that there is remarkable similarity in the way species respond in choice situations. And it turns out that most species under most circumstances, will, given a choice, will take small immediate reinforcers versus deferring the reinforcement, even though they could actually get more reinforcement by delaying the reinforcer. In other words, self-control, oftentimes impulsivity rules. And there are many reasons why impulsivity will rule. Uh, and certainly when you read the Pearson-Cheney stuff, you're going to get into reading about how some of those variables change. You'll read some of the work in terms of, do I choose to go to a party on Friday or should I study? What's the right decision? When I make a decision and commit versus not committing. And there's a great section in the book. Um, it describes an experiment by uh, Jack McDowell. I highly recommend it. It's a great, great experiment there. Another thing we might consider is how do punishment contingencies affect preferences for free choice? That is, we may be able to choose between option A and option B, but on option A, we could get a reinforcer, but there's a risk involved that there may be a punisher there. Option B, has less reinforcement. However, there's also less opportunity to get punished here. So again, risks come with more reinforcement, but possible more punishment built into it. Okay, so sometimes playing stocks gives you more reinforcement, but there's more risk, more reinforcement and more possible punishment. You could go more conservative and pick maybe something which is uh, less risky, you might actually go into mutual funds versus stocks. Okay, uh, it does not gain reinforcement more rapidly, but it also is not uh, is least likely to have risks. And a lot of this has been determined by the conditions prevalent at the time you make these choices. Many people were making high risks back in the early 2000s. You don't see a whole lot of that happening in 2007 and 8 and 9. People are a little bit less hesitant to make those risks. Certainly, banks are not making those risks, which is why they're no longer lending, because they cannot make those risks. Um, so again, because of the possible punishment situations. And as you all remember, in a very famous scene in the movies, we see Indiana Jones. And he is confronting one of the, uh, the Templar Knights in the table, uh, uh, from the Knights of the Round Table. And he has to make a choice uh, of which... Uh, cup may be, may actually be the Holy Grail. And as you recall, if he chooses the right cup, he has eternal life. But if he chooses the wrong cup, it takes away life. Okay? And here we have a situation where Indiana Jones had to confront a reinforced situation of making a choice when there was a heavy-duty punisher uh, associated with it. And then finally, we may look at other things here, such as how do preference contingencies generate other complex behaviors that we typically call impulsivity, self-control, commitment. 
these are terms that have been typically reserved for much of the field of psychology and lay language when they talk about impulsivity. But quite uh, differently, we talk about it in terms of contingencies of reinforcement that give rise to these complex kinds of behaviors that we've come to describe as impulsive or showing less impulsivity and more self-control. Okay. And in certain circumstances, Impulsivity actually is a good decision. When you have limited time to make a decision, you want to possibly make a very quick decision because every time you delay, you might actually come away with punishing circumstances. Sometimes impulsivity leads to bad decisions in which we may want to go in and study the situation a little bit more. Impulsive buying is not necessarily a good thing. Self-control and studying and looking at shopping around for the best possible price is a good decision. And for that, and because people know that and manufacturers know that, manufacturers will try to induce impulsivity by saying, buy our car, but buy quickly because this offer is limited. And before you have time to analyze, is that a good deal or a bad deal, we say, well, I better make a decision because the sale is going to be gone. And sometimes you make a very bad decision. Again, when we talk about choice and preference, there is a great deal more to choice and preference than just simply having a person select this reinforcer versus that one. So as you study reinforcer selection processes, and you will study the forced choice procedure versus another procedure when you take the other classes, take a consideration that the choice of reinforcer that you determine today could very rapidly change tomorrow or the next day based on availability of reinforcers elsewhere. Okay, with that, I am going to close and certainly hope that you continue to study the quantification of behavior analysis. And I would again encourage you, please read that chapter on choice and preference. Read as far into it as you can. And whenever possible, if you do go to the conferences, please take the time to attend some of the tutorials that are offered by the Society for the Quantitative Analysis Behavior, which is called SQUAB. They hold a pre-conference, a pre-convention conference every single year. And these are wonderful places to talk with some of the researchers who have been doing this research for many, many years. And I can tell you, uh, hanging around these guys, they really would like to talk to practitioners more because many of the things that we are confronted with when we write behavior plans for children, for parents, teachers, families, uh, and so forth and so on, many of the things that we have to confront are the things that would interest uh, researchers in this field. They are always interested in looking at things that practitioners are doing and ways in which their research may impact uh, making better behavior plans for us. With that, I'm going to close, and when we come back, we will talk about verbal behavior. Till then, 